you so much for joining us for our Lunch and Learn today, a people's virtual walking tour of Portland. Our speaker, Seth Goldstein, is a professor at the Maine College of Art and a local historian who weaves history, architecture, and more into his guided walks and boat tours, which do happen in person. Uh, we're glad to have him for our virtual tour today. Next slide. My name is Kathleen Neal. I'm the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters, Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations work to protect Maine's environment and our democracy by building diverse coalitions, influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Next slide and a few technical notes. You are all muted, but we do want to hear from you. Please send your questions to me, Kathleen, through the chat as they occur to you. Uh, you can find the chat by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your screen, and I will keep track of your questions to ask Seth during the Q&A session at the end. If you have any technical difficulties during today's event, please message Will Sedlak through the chat function. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, along with recordings of all our previous lunch and learns. Thank you again for joining us and Seth, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks Kathleen. Let's see here. I'm going to share my screen and put up my presentation here. And how's that? Are you seeing my desktop? Not yet. Not yet, Seth. Okay, let's try here. Not yet? Not yet, Seth. Okay, let me see here. I just have a window of Kathleen here. Oh, here we go. Okay, now I'm gonna hit share screen. Share, oh, okay, I think I got it here. And now... Now we got it. Yay, wonderful. How, so there's my presentation, yes? Looks perfect. Perfect, wonderful. Seth. All right. Well, let me introduce myself. I'm Seth Goldstein. Uh, as Kathleen said, I'm a maritime historian based out of the greater Portland area. I'm a professor of history at the Maine College of Art. I'm the education coordinator for the Atlantic Black Box Project, uh, where I work with Dr. Meadow Dibble. I'm also on the board of the South Portland Historic Society, and I'm the owner and proprietor of Main Street Tours, um, through which I do walking tours and boat tours of the old port of Portland. And I've done that for probably about the last seven years. So before I begin my presentation, I just want to say that my historical thinking on this topic has evolved over the past five or six years. When I fir when, uh, first came to my attention that New England was involved with the Atlantic world slave economy, I thought to myself, well, maybe there's some involvement, but not that much. Well, and I'm a, I'm a historian and, and I didn't think there was that much involvement. What I've come to find, and what maybe some of you are coming to find uh, now as well, uh, through my conversations with Dr. Dibble, through reading uh, this increasing body of scholarship about New England and the Atlantic world slave economy, what I've come to find is that New England was intimately tied to this Atlantic world slave economy. And what I'll hope to do today is to show you uh, some of those connections. So we're gonna start our tour today. Here we see map of uh, Portland, there's duck fat, so we can all orientate ourselves around delicious French fries. And the first stop today will be G the George Cleave statue on the Portland waterfront. We'll then virtually make our way a little west along the waterfront to the base of India Street, which was the site of Fort Loyal uh, during King Philip's War in the colonial period. Uh, we'll then make our way a little bit further down the waterfront to the site of the John B. Brown Sugar Factory, which was the largest building on the Portland waterfront during the 19th century. 
We'll then double back to Exchange Street, where we'll pass by Lloyd Scott's secondhand clothing store, which was a part of the Underground Railroad. And finally, we'll arrive at the Abyssinian Meeting House, which is the, was the first uh, African American church in Portland. It's the third oldest African American meeting house that remains in the United States today, uh, following churches that were built earlier, I believe in Boston and Nantucket. So here we are on the Portland waterfront. It's a beautiful day for a walk, uh, nice and sunny out. And here we are at the statue of George Cleves. And George Cleves is considered the founder of Portland. Uh, this statue sits on private land that is still to this day in the possession of Cleves descendants. It's currently operated as the Portland Yacht Services. Now, when the city was first offered this statue in 2002, they refused it based on evidence that Cleves may have been a slave owner, and hence that's why it sits on this private land. Now, according to William B. Jordan, who is a local historian, in his uh, History of Cape Elizabeth, which was published in 1965, Cleves arrives on the peninsula in 1633 with his business partner and his, quote, servant, Oliver Weeks. Now, I recently attended a conference on African slavery in New England, and I had the opportunity to ask Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who's the associate professor at the Ohio State University and a host of the Teaching Hard History podcast, if the word servant was used as a code word for slave in primary source documents. And just so the listeners know, a primary source document for historians is a document that's written at or soon after the events it depicts. So these are old documents that are written about the time of the events. So I asked him, you know, in, in these primary source documents, this word servant feels loaded to me. He replied that individuals absolutely use the word servant in historic documents instead of the word slave. Dr. Jeffries asserts that not only did these individuals own enslaved peoples, they felt self-conscious enough about it to change the word in the historic record. That is to say they knew slavery was wrong and hence purposely tried to obscure the truth from later generations. Now, we may never know if Oliver Weeks was an enslaved person or an indentured servant. There may, we're probably never gonna find the smoking gun that says definitively that he was an enslaved African. However, with other colonial figures from the time, we're 100% we're certain. So if we look across the virtual uh, Portland Harbor here, we're looking across to, to Bug Light, uh, which was known historically as Cushing Point. Uh, on that piece of land, Colonel Ezekiel Cushing uh, was one of the first merchants to be operating in what became known as the West Indies trade, trade with the Caribbean. Uh, he was based out of Simonton Cove, which today we all know better as Willard Beach. Um, now this area was the most popular anchorage in greater Portland area before 1760. So before there was shipping in Portland Harbor, there were ships that were trading internationally based out of what we know as today as Willard Beach. Now, Cushing was known as, quote, well-to-do, and he built the first two-story house on the point that is still named after him today, which is Cushing Point. But we know it better today as Bug Light Park. Uh, William B. Jordan, once again, the author of History of Cape Elizabeth, uh, says that, as was the case with many colonial men of means, Cushing owned Negro slaves. When Cushing died in 1765, he left two slaves, Cato and Phyllis, to his son Thomas, and a four-year-old Negro girl, Dinah, to his wife, Mary. So, you know, a lot of us think, oh, well, slavery was something that took place in the American South, not something that took place in the North here. Here we were abolitionists. But in fact, slavery is not abolished in Massachusetts, which of course, Maine is part of Massachusetts until 1820, and we're celebrating our bicentennial this year. Uh, slavery is legal in Massachusetts and Maine until 1783, uh, which some people find surprising. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the first peoples of this area. So uh, first peoples of this area were known as the Wabanaki. They had sub-tribes that they were broken into, uh, the Saco, the Penobscot, the Kennebec. Um, 
Unfortunately, what happens to large numbers of these first peoples are what is known as virgin soil epidemics. It's the same thing that happens to first peoples in South America and Mexico and Central America. Native um, uh, North Americans have not been exposed to the, some of the diseases common in Europe, smallpox, hepatitis, chickenpox, pneumonia, measles, and so they don't have any natural immunities to these diseases. And hence, when they catch these diseases, primarily smallpox, but also some of these other diseases that you're seeing, they, they wind up just dying uh, en masse. And what will happen is that there'll be nobody in the village who is well enough to take care of the sick people, and so the entire village will pass. Um, so major epidemic, which begins around 1616, they go from a population in Maine from about 20,000 first peoples in the early 1600s, uh, only about 5,500 native peoples survived by 1650. And this is information that I gleaned from the Penobscot Maritime Museum. So this is the reason why when the pilgrims show up in 1620 in Plymouth, they find fields, but nobody tending them. They find empty villages because these diseases had worked their way down from the main coast uh, to southern New England. Now, where do these diseases first come from? They come from fishermen who are fishing on the main coast. And at first, these fishermen are fishing seasonally and trading with first peoples. And then they start to have these more permanent fishing stage, stage, uh, stations on the islands off the coast of Maine. So in trading trade goods with these first peoples, they inadvertently also trade uh, these pathogens. So that's unfortunately what happens to large numbers of these first peoples here in Maine and the rest of New England. Um, we have a series of conflicts that begin in 1675 that are known as the French and Indian Wars. We have King Philip's War, which begins in southern New England, but then winds up um, also catching on up here. King William's War, Queen Anne's War, Doomer's War, King George's War, and the French and Indian Wars. But we can really think of this as 80 years of protracted warfare on the main frontier uh, that are intermittently broken up by peace. Um, and it's just a period of brutal, brutal warfare. Now, some of the contributing factors to these French and Indian Wars are, one, first peoples become increasingly dependent on European trade goods. And the primary trade good uh, is muskets and powder and shot. And so first peoples um, become very used to using these muskets for their hunting. And so if Europeans take these trade goods away, which they will intermittently do, then all of a sudden these first peoples lose a large ability to feed their families. Uh, second contributing factor, Andromus fish, which are fish that swim up river to spawn, like salmon, herring, um, alewives. Now, these Andromus fish are a very important food source for First Peoples, and they're severely impacted by European weir nets, which is a net that Europeans would put across an entire river to catch all the fish, uh, and then also dams built for mills on rivers, which would also keep the Andromus fish from swimming up river. And these dams would be built for mills, maybe a grist mill, may even be a lumber mill. But what happens is Andromus fish can't swim up, they can't breed, and so they're not making any baby fish. Uh, so these whole stocks of fish die off, uh, another important food source lost for the First Peoples. Uh, number three, European livestock running rampant on First Peoples lands. And I see this in the primary sources very often. Uh, the cows of Europeans would just be left to wander. They would wander across First Peoples fields and destroy their crops. Uh, number four, differing conceptions of land ownership. First Peoples did not think of land ownership as permanent. Uh, they envisioned it more as part of like an oral contract that was null and void once the parties had passed away, which is not the same conception that the Europeans had of land ownership. Obviously that was hereditary. And number five, existing Christian and European conceptions of quote, just wars against non-Christians that had begun to form around the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula. And some of you may, you know, we all remember that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but 1492 was also the year of, that the uh, Spanish finally expelled the Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula. And so in the course of these wars against Muslim peoples in the Iberian Peninsula over a couple hundred years, there had started to be um, these ideas that you could 
have war and kill non-Christians without repercussions. So one of these wars, King Philip's War, the second war, uh, the people of Portland are attacked uh, by a, a combined French and um, uh, first peoples from the Kennebec and Penobscot tribes, and they besiege the fort for four days, after which the commander, Sylvanius Davis, surrenders after gaining assurances that the English would be permitted safe passage to the nearest English town. Now, instead, what happens is when the English come out, they're massacred by the French and the Wabanaki, uh, and some of them are taken as prisoners uh, to be enslaved back in Canada as slaves uh, for rich people, rich French people in, in cities like Quebec. So it's just an example of how brutal this warfare is for 80 years, and it's brutal on all sides. Another example of this brutality would be when in 1694, the General Court of Massachusetts passed, quote, an act for the encouraging the prosecution of the Indian enemy and rebels, colonists were encouraged to kill and scalp first peoples, uh, quote, for every Indian, great or small, which they shall kill, the sum of 50 pounds per head was the reward. So it wasn't the scalp of necessarily a warrior, it was a scalp of any first people, uh, a child, a grandparent, uh, just gives you an idea of the brutal, brutal and inhumane nature of this warfare. So here we see uh, enslaved first peoples exchange, exchange for African slaves. So we have to remember the entire point of colonies and colonialism is to make money. Sometimes money for the state, sometimes to make money for a private company uh, of investors like the Massachusetts Bay Colony or the Plymouth Colony. Um, to make money colonies needed labor. It was all about labor. First peoples were first enslaved by Columbus during his second voyage to the Americas. Now England would later look to the earlier examples of the Spanish and Portuguese and how they procured bonded labor for their colonies, first exploiting the indigenous Americans and later importing enslaved Africans. In New England, the English were able to manipulate an existing system of captive taking amongst First People tribes. In wars between the First Peoples, the ultimate aim of warfare was to capture your enemy. Not to kill them, but to capture them. The prisoners could then be taken back to the village where the whole tribe could enact their vengeance. Uh, the captives would sometimes be killed, they would sometimes be forced into harsh servitude, but there are also many instances where these captives were adopted into the families of the people who had captured them. Now with the arrival of Europeans and increasing first people's dependence on European trade goods like muskets, this system of warfare is perverted to the benefit of Europeans' unquenchable appetite for labor. The English realized that if they exchange captive first peoples in the West Indies, for enslaved Africans, there is less of a chance that these enslaved Africans would abscond or revolt. They don't know the territory, as First Peoples certainly do, so they're less likely to run away. Furthermore, whereas First Peoples have limited legal protections in New England, enslaved Africans have no legal protections in New England. The first documentation of this type of exchange is from the Pequot War, which is fought between English colonists and the Pequot tribe of modern day Connecticut. Uh, this was fought between 1636 and 1638. Captive Pequots are sent to the English colony of Providence Island in exchange for enslaved Africans. Here we see on the bottom a salt uh, pod fish. Uh, a fish so important, it got its own biography, a wonderful book named Cod. Uh, by a gentleman named Mark Kurlansky, which I would strongly recommend. And to the top there, you see salt cod. Now, salt cod is the most inexpensive protein before refrigeration, and hence, large quantities of salt cod are shipped from New England uh, to feed enslaved Africans in the West Indies. I have a wonderful quote here that I'd like to share. It's from an essay called Comunidad Escondida, 
Latin American influence in 19th and 20th century Portland. And it's by a gentleman named David Carey Jr. And it was published in a book called Creating Portland. And I'd like to share this quote because I cannot put this more eloquently or more succinctly than Mr. Carey has. So I'll quote here, by the late 1820s, Cuba had become the world's largest sugar producer, and most of it was going to the United States and England. Concurrently, Maine supplied Cuban planters with the salt fish to feed their slaves, and Portland was Maine's fish export center. By selling the food that sustained them and consuming what they produced, Maine's major ports became a primary beneficiary of Cuban slave labor. Maine's historical relationship with slavery is complex. Its collaboration with Cuban slavery contradicts its stance against domestic slavery. Portland's entrepreneurs who feasted on Cuban sugar stood in stark contrast to Maine's abolitionist movement and the state's contribution of troops to fight the South in the Civil War. Paradoxically, Portlanders were structurally involved in slavery abroad, yet intolerant of it on their own soil. This cognitive dissonance, I love that term, this cognitive dissonance reveals moral standards that were malleable in the face of profits and comforts, says Mr. Carey. Further trade with the West Indies between Maine involved lumber and food. Now, what we'll have to remember here is that Cuba is basically a monoculture at this time. They've cut down all the forests and all the different food crops uh, so they can just grow sugar because sugar is such a big cash crop. And so hence they need lumber and they need uh, foodstuffs. So here is a quote from a gentleman named Roe who wrote this book, uh, Maritime History of Maine, which quite old now, uh, about 70 years old. But he says, then also there were house frames all ready to put up. So, so houses that had been built uh, in their components and that would be shipped to the West Indies and then could be assembled once they got to their destination. O um, oxen and horse for the plow, the sugar and the treadmill. So there uh, beasts of burden being sent down to the Caribbean from Maine. Farm produce such as parsnips, potatoes, onions, and grain, beef, mutton, pork, pickled fish, soap, candles, and dried codfish in drums of uh, from five to 800 pounds each. Well, that's a lot of codfish. Uh, lumber from the banks of Maine rivers, which cost there $8, a thousand sold in Havana for $60. Beets and parsnips brought $16 a barrel in the French island. So they're talking about uh, some of the French islands in the Caribbean, like Martinique, for example. So here we see John B. Brown's Portland Sugar House. And there's so much sugar coming up from Cuba in the 1850s that this is the largest building on the Portland waterfront. Um, Portland imports three times as much molasses at this time as Boston. And the Portland Sugar Works is processing 200 hogshead, a hogshead being a 63 gallon cask, 200 hogsheads of molasses a day. By 1855, the business employs between 150 and 200 workers, and 10 years later, it employs almost 1,000 individuals. About this time, 20% of all the molasses in the U.S. is processed right here in Portland, more than any other city in the U.S. So here we're looking at a photograph. This is the Grand Trunk Terminal and Grain Elevator. Um, this is close to uh, the base of India Street today, where India Street meets Commercial Street. Uh, you can see this giant grain elevator over here on the right and a Grand Trunk Railroad building on the left. So many African-American men work as longshoremen or stevedores uh, in the early 1800s. Following the Irish famine, the Irish potato famine in the 1840s, most of these workers are forced out of the occupation by large numbers of recent Irish immigrants who come to dominate the work along the Portland waterfront for the remainder of the century. This change coincides with change in commodities along the waterfront, whereas in the first half of the century, Portland's trade is largely with the West Indies, trade changes in the second half of the century uh, to be Canadian grain. 
Longshoremen from the African diaspora are prohibited from joining unions and hence are excluded from the nepotism that evolves around jobs and union membership. Changing conceptions around race in the 1850s and 1860s lead to conflict between the recently arrived Irish immigrants who identified themselves as white versus individuals from the African diaspora who are increasingly seen as racially different. So here we see uh, underground railroad uh, tracks, uh, paths, uh, people trying to get to Canada from the American South and freedom. To the left here, you'll see a poster uh, to warn people of the African diaspora to watch out in Boston. Uh, watchmen and police are looking for them, kidnappers and slave catchers. Um, keep a keen, sharp lookout. Um, because what happens is the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 requires lawmen to capture any escaped slaves and return them to their owners in the South. And also, as you can see, uh, people are incentivized financially. Oh, I have seen documents where they're offering a $200 reward uh, for the return of enslaved Africans. Here we see an 1845 silver dollar that my friend Matt Anson uh, found with his metal detector on the shore of Mary Meeting Bay. The impression that you see at the top, if you look to the top of that coin, you see that there are these circle indentures on it. Um, they're supposed to be the shape of the Big Dipper, which the enslaved Africans would have called the drinking gourd. So they would have followed the North Star through the Big Dipper to Canada and freedom. So you can see the big hole at the bottom. What Matt and I hypothesize is that somebody was wearing this as a necklace and somehow lost it on the shores of Mary Meeting Bay while uh, participating in the Underground Railroad and trying to reach Canada and freedom. Now these, is, you can see here, once again, the drinking gourd, the Big Dipper here on the Portland Freedom Trail markers. Uh, Portland Freedom Trail is uh, 16 different sites throughout Portland that highlight the African American experience uh, in Portland. Um, some of them are sites of locations of the Underground Railroad. Uh, for example, Lloyd Scott's secondhand clothing store on Exchange Street uh, would have been, is one of the sites. Uh, and that's important because secondhand clothing store, uh, they could have helped you change your appearance uh, with different clothing if you were an escaped uh, enslaved person. Also, a lot of African Americans go into the trade of barbers. Once again, so you could uh, change your appearance and hopefully not be captured due to the Fugitive Slave Act and returned uh, to the American South. And other uh, people who are on the Portland Freedom Trail are hack drivers, like this gentleman, Ruben Ruby here. Now a hack is just a horse drawn, drawn taxi, but as a hack driver, Ruby would have been able to transport uh, enslaved men, men, women, and children throughout the city to various safe houses and eventually help them on their way to Canada. So I see that I'm running short on time here, so I will just briefly finish up. Uh, Munjoy Hill in Portland's East End is the multi-ethnic neighborhood in Portland. Now the population is predominantly English and Protestant with a small African American population up until about 1850. Then you have your first group of immigrants, which is primarily Irish, later Italian, Eastern Europeans, Jews, Greeks, Armenians, and Poles, all live at the base of Munjoy Hill. And so here we see, this is the Abyssinian Meeting House, which I was speaking of earlier. It was built in 1828. Um, it sits at the foot of Munjoy Hill in that neighborhood I was describing. The church was built by members of Portland's African diaspora community who were tired of sitting in the back balconies of the city's white churches and decided to build their own house of worship. According to Mike Conley in his book, Seated by the Sea, the census figures showed that the city had a highly racially segregated housing pattern. At the time, there were seven wards the black population was squeezed into Ward 1 on Munjoy Hill, which was derisively characterized as N-Word Hill. Now today, the Abyssinian is listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but it is in desperate need of funding to continue the renovations that have been ongoing for the last 25 years. I invite you to read a great article that was published in the Portland Press Herald on June 21st that provides a lot of details about the Abyssinian 
meeting house and where they are now. So in closing, I would just like to say, people wanna know why is this history important? Who cares, why is it important? I think it's important because we as a nation, as a region, and as the state of Maine have to understand how deeply the roots of systematic racism go back and how deep those roots are, not just for the American South, but for the nation as a whole. It is this history that has directly led us to our current untenable position regarding racial inequality in our country. To put it another way, we can't fix our present until we understand our past. So please get out there in the vote this fall and thank you very much. Thank you, Seth. Uh, that was hands down the best walking tour I've ever experienced from my own home. <laughs> <laughs> But it is, it is good to get out there and explore history ourselves. So today's call to action points to the Atlantic Black Box. Uh, we actually featured this Portland-based public history project in a Lunch and Learn last month. So if you missed that, you, should, we'll, uh, you can find the link on our, our website and uh, we'll share a link, share that link this afternoon. Uh, the email we share this afternoon will also include the most important call to action that we could possibly share, an invitation to shape history by voting. Um, at Maine Conservation Voters, we firmly believe that requesting an absentee ballot is the single best way that you can prepare for the election this November. Maine's absentee ballot for, form is, or absentee ballot request form is live on the Secretary of State's website and we will send that link this afternoon as well. But first, let's get into some questions. Uh, the first question, Seth, is uh, one of our participants is really interested in the, the status of the uh, meeting house today and just what other information you can share. Well, I was, had the pleasure of bringing one of my Mecca classes um, to the Abyssinian Meeting House last fall, uh, was something that I was able to do with the help of Greater Portland Landmarks. And the, the, the building was in, in horrible shape when they started the renovations about 20 years ago. The roof was about to collapse. Um, and, and so they were just in the nick of time able to save this building, but they, they have been receiving funding so haltingly over the years um, that the renovations have been very start and stop. Now I know that because of the events of the last couple months, there has been this kind of blossoming of interest in the Abyssinian Meeting House and that they have received a lot of funding. When I was there with my students last fall, uh, there was still no floor. So uh, what I, you know, my understanding was that uh, when it rained, uh, a small river would kind of run through the, the, the ground floor of the building. I know that since then they've been able to, to put a floor in place and recently they completed a staircase uh, to the second story. And the renovations are being done very much in the way that the renovations were done at the Portland Observatory. They're trying to leave as much original material as possible. But as I said, there was this wonderful, wonderful article in the Portland Press Herald on June 21st that was all about the Abyssinian Meeting House. So if you'd like to know more about the current state of the Abyssinian Meeting House or how to get involved with the Abyssinian Meeting House or to donate to the Abyssinian Meeting House, then I would strongly recommend uh, going back to the Portland Press Herald and bringing up that article from June 21st. Thanks. That's a great resource, and we will um, we'll look for that uh, that link and see if we can share that out with you all as well. Um, there's we're curious too. Are there other ways that we can support bringing Black history into public awareness in Portland? Well, certainly, um, you know, through supporting the Atlantic Black Box Project, we've made this one of our our big initiatives. Um, is, is education and also, uh, I think specifically education of our young people, uh, so important to, to get school groups uh, involved in this type of education. But uh, Atlantic Black Box, if you haven't checked out our website, it's a fantastic website with lots of resources 
uh, and many different ways for people to contribute. One of the ideas behind the Atlantic Black Box is that we're gonna crowdsource this history. It's not my history, it's not your history, it's not academics history, this is the people's history. Uh, and hence we wanna get uh, everybody involved, whether it's school groups, young people, uh, various organizations and individuals. So I would strongly recommend uh, check out this wonderful website uh, that that Dr. Dibble has put together. It's a, it's incredible. It's not only is it beautiful to look at, but it's incredibly functional. It is a, a, just a great project. So thanks for for highlighting that. Um, we have a question about what percentage of Maine's current black population are descendants of enslaved or free black people who were in Maine in the 17 and 1800s? Well, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but I know that the population of people of African heritage or people from the African diaspora has only decreased um, since the 19th century. So there are, are less um, up until probably recently due to the recent wave of refugee migration from uh, various parts of Africa, mm -hmm. there were less people of African descent in Maine um, in, in most of the 20th century than there were in the 19th century. Uh, as far as exact numbers, I, I, I couldn't tell you that um, off the top of my head, but I, perhaps we could uh, dig into that and, and have that information available at the Atlantic Black Box website at a later date. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, you mentioned the strict sort of segregated housing patterns uh, of the past and curious how those show up in modern Portland, if, if at all. Well, I think that still Munjoy Hill is the um, most diverse part of the peninsula, uh, the base of Munjoy Hill. And it was, um, you know, historically going back into uh, maybe say from 1850 on, uh, that was one of the areas where, as I said, the uh, people from the African diaspora lived. It was one of the big centers of Irish immigrants, and the Irish being one of the biggest immigrant groups uh, in Portland. Um, but I, today, certainly, you know, Portland is geographically more diverse. Um, well, you know, the interesting thing about Portland is that we really see historically where the money was because we have this Western promenade with these big, beautiful palatial houses. Now, those houses were built uh, by merchants, uh, many of whom who made their money uh, trading in the West Indies. So I think that Portland's physical environment is remarkable because when we start to walk around and we start to comprehend why buildings were built off of um, you know, what commodities and uh, various trades, we really see how intricate Portland, uh, the, the physical geography of Portland is um, to our historical past. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating that there's, it's actually, that history is written on the city. Well, and so many people don't think of this when they're walking around Portland. I hope that this lecture will help people see the city they live in uh, in this new light, you know, when we walk by the Portland Art Museum, the some of the original art that what that became the Museum of Art in Portland was from the collection of John um, John Brown, who was the gentleman who owned that sugar refinery. He bought all of the land on the Western Prom, and he built a palatial mansion called Brom Hill, which that area is still known as Brom Hill. Now that, that mansion burned down, but he sold plots of land to all of his rich merchant friends up there on the Western Promenade. And so those houses on the Western Prom are direct evidence of this West Indies trade. Wow. Is there, what kind of efforts are there to, to recognize this full history of, of Portland, I mean, in addition to the, the sorry about that. Not at all. <laughs> um, in addition to Atlantic Black Box and the work that you're doing, do we see that showing up in like the public land and public parks in Portland, or you know, the, is there an official effort by the city, or well, is that work for us to do? Yeah, I think that's a lot of work for us to do. But you know, I've noticed through 
you know, the historical organizations that I follow and that I'm affiliated with, there's a growing interest in this body of scholarship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you take a look at, for example, I follow uh, the Maine Historical Society on Instagram, you know, they have uh, in recent months been posting um, information that's much more uh, relevant to the experience of people in the African diaspora, first peoples, women, uh, people who were traditionally disenfranchised uh, from the historical record. Uh, and same thing goes with the historical society that I'm affiliated with here in South Portland. Um, the director of the historical society here has been, she publishes a weekly column in a local paper, and she's been trying to highlight the experience of people from the African diaspora here in South Portland and in Cape Elizabeth. Um, so we're starting to see uh, these institutions, uh, some of these uh, city and small town historical societies um, starting to maybe come around um, to this history and to starting to see um, its importance and starting to recognize that the history of the African diaspora, the history of First Peoples is really American history. It's not a separate history, it's the history that built America. Uh, the country. So uh, I'm heartened by that um, kind of uh, renewed interest in these topics. Yeah, that's just incredible. Thank you. Um, thinking a little bit beyond the, the boundaries of Portland and South Portland, uh, what relationship, if, if any, was there between the settlement of uh, Malaga Island and the free Black people of Portland? Well, I know that there was um, a fair amount of uh, intermarriage uh, where people from Portland um, were related to uh, people from Malaga Island. Um, but as far as other direct connections between Portland as a, as a city and Malaga Island, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that, Kathleen. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting to think about that, that evidence, that architectural evidence of the trade with the West Indies. Uh, were there also, so we know that, that we were importing products to Portland. Sure. Were shipbuilders in Maine also, or, or were the ships built in Maine also carrying slaves here or, or to any other southern port? Well, that's a great question, Kathleen. And if I had had time today to touch on that topic, I certainly would have. Um, it's, it's a topic of its own that deserves its own entire, you know, not half hour lecture, but you know, an, an hour, hour and a half. What, what we've come to find um, through research and a colleague that Dr. Dibble and I work with through Atlantic Black Box, uh, Dr. Kate McMah Mc Mc McMahon, uh, is that many ships that many of the ships that were used in the illicit slave trade so uh, slave trade being illegal after 1808 if I remember serves me correct in the United States many of the ships that were used in this illicit slave trade were built right here in Maine because Maine is the shipping the shipbuilding center of the United States so they're not building ships in South Carolina for the illicit slave trade they're not building ships um, you know, um, you know, in, in, in Florida for the illicit slave trade, the center of shipbuilding in the United States at that time is New England, specifically Maine. So large numbers uh, of, of ships built in Maine are used in the illicit slave trade. In addition to that, the, the sailors who sailed these ships were from Maine. The captains who captained these ships were Maine captains. And you probably all heard from Meadow um, when she did her presentation, Meadow and I uh, grew up together, by the way, in, in the town of Brewster on Cape Cod. I didn't know that. That's yeah, so and, fun. And, and well, we had the same bus stop. She lived right down the street from me. <laughs> oh we goodness. grew up in this beautiful town of Brewster, um, which is known for its sea captain's houses, right? And, and, you know, we grew up there. We never thought anything of it. But what we've come to find out and, you know, what Meadow, this is really what sparked the Meadow's interest and got this whole project going, the Atlantic Black Box, that these captains from Brewster with their beautiful Victorian mansions with the widow's walks on top of them, these captains had an intimate knowledge of the west coast of Africa. Now, it wasn't because they were trading in gold dust and ivory, right? They, these were 
the people who had the best knowledge and they had the knowledge of where to go to purchase the slaves. And so they would be hired by usually a firm based out of New York, would hire um, you know, a, a vessel and a captain and a crew and fund it. And these were funded by shares uh, of investors from New York. Everybody would have a little share in all these various slaving voyages uh, so that if something happened and the ship was captured, they wouldn't lose a lot of money. Um, but these were, were ships, uh, voyages that were financed largely in New York, that were on ships that were built in Maine, that were crewed by, uh, by sailors from New England, and that were captained likewise uh, by captains from, from New England. So um, a huge, huge uh, part of this illicit slave trade um, was conducted by Maine vessels and individuals from Maine. And this is one of the big projects that the Atlantic Black Box Project is working on. Um, uh, Dr. Mc McMullen has a uh, database, a spreadsheet of ships that she's putting together from Maine. And as we discover new ships, we plug them in, uh, where they came from, where they went to, what the captain was, as much information as we can find out about them as we try to create a more complete picture of this illicit slave trade and New England's complicity in that slave trade. A lot to reckon with. It's, it's a huge topic uh, in of itself. Um, switching gears a little bit, there's a question about, uh, so you cited the figure of 20,000 native people prior to contact with Europeans. Sure. What, what geography does that relate to? Is that- That would be, that would, my understanding is that's Maine. And okay. that information, as I said, I gleaned from uh, the Penobscot Maritime Museum. So that leads me to think that specifically it's about Maine. Also, the numbers uh, would be low for all of New England, right? Okay. And we, we know that history of, uh, of disease in, infecting Native people here. Were there any diseases that were prevalent in the Americas that Europeans contracted? Syphilis. Ah, interesting. Yeah, but that, that's the only one that I'm aware of. Okay, okay. Although Europeans did die in large numbers uh, on the west coast of Africa from yellow fever, uh, which, you know, Meadow presented some of that with her disease ship, I'm sure, when right. she went over her topic. Um, and, and likewise, in the, uh, in the tropical areas uh, like the West Indies, they would uh, very often contract yellow fever uh, while participating in, in trade, in, as I said, in both West Africa and the Caribbean. Um, thank you. So thinking about some of the build, some of the historic buildings you mentioned, uh, the, the sugar house, the secondhand clothing store, are those still, do, can we see remnants of those in, in modern day Portland? Well, so the, the, Building that uh, Lloyd Scott's secondhand clothing store was in on Exchange Street is still there today. Um, a lot of these buildings burned down in the Great Fire of 1866. Um, now, I was unaware of this until, you know, a few years ago when I started to lecture on the, the sugar factory. Uh, apparently, sugar will burn spectacularly for days. And that sugar factory uh, smoldered on the Portland waterfront for days and days. They rebuilt it. Um, but by the time it was rebuilt, the center of sugar production had moved to other parts of the country. So it was never as successful as it once was. But, you know, a large portion of the city, about a third of the city is destroyed in 1866. But there are many buildings that were built subsequently. Um, they, they started rebuilding after the Great Fire almost immediately. So some of the buildings are completed in 1867. And I believe that's the case of the building um, that Lloyd Scott's secondhand clothing store is in. So if you walk down Exchange Street and you're on the right hand side, you'll come across one of those Portland Freedom Trail markers and it's right in front of the building uh, that Lloyd Scott had uh, that secondhand clothing store in. So some of these buildings still remain. Um, a lot of the um, infrastructure does not. You know, another great example of how the um, physical kind of nature of Portland was affected by this West Indies trade is the fact that the entire Portland waterfront was filled in at 1850. So 4th Street was called 4th Street because it used to be on the Four River, which is what uh, the harbor is called as it kind of tapers into a, a smaller body of water there. And so that was the waterfront uh, before 1850. 
um, they filled it in in 1850 to accommodate uh, a railroad that would connect the Grand Trunk Railroad, which was kind of in the north of the city, with the rail terminus from Boston, but also to make room for all these new piers to accommodate mm -hmm. all of these goods that were being shipped to the West Indies and also to receive all this sugar and molasses and rum that was in turn being exported to uh, Portland. So the entire, you know, um, the entire part of Portland that's from 4th Street towards the water, Commercial Street basically, was, was before 1850, that would have been underwater. Right. Um, so the buildings on 4th Street, uh, if you look at them, um, the buildings on Wharf Street, which is that cobblestone street, um, if you look at the back of the buildings on Wharf Street, those are seawalls because the ocean was right there. Now, Wharf Street is called Wharf Street because quite literally that's where the wharfs were, right, uh, before they filled this in. And as I said, so the physical topography of Portland is all changed because of this trade. And I think that's a, you know, a great example is the Portland waterfront. Now, if you look down 4th Street, you'll see it's kind of serpentine. Uh, it's not a straight street. And that's because it followed the banks of the river. And that's why 4th Street has that shape. Fascinating. This is, this is great. Thank you. We have a couple of educators on the, the webinar today and wondering if you have recommendations for, for resources to share this information with kids. So middle school, uh, anything like that. Well, this is something that we've been working on uh, really hard the last few months, um, Dr. Dibble and myself. And I recently attended a, a conference um, in Salem about, uh, for educators, how to teach this topic of uh, African enslavement. And also there's one resource that I just, I have to plug is this podcast um, called Teaching Hard History, Teaching American Slavery. It's amazing. It's uh, hosted by, as I saw, uh, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries from the University of Ohio. And what they have is scholars um, from all around the country presenting their material um, from a book. I'm looking around here for my, I have a book that is, do to ah. Here we are, sorry about that. So here you see, this is, uh, oops, there we go. Yeah. Teaching American Slavery, right? So Understanding and Teaching American Slavery, and it's edited uh, by a couple of individuals. But what these are, they're essays by various scholars, professors from colleges, uh, detailing how to teach different portions of African enslavement to different people. So how to teach uh, comparative slavery, how slavery is different in the American South, uh, from the Caribbean, from Brazil, how to teach plantation slavery, how to teach slavery to people of different uh, age groups, how, how to teach slavery and feel comfortable doing it, which is such a big thing. It's, you know, we, we don't, you know, people don't talk about these things because it's uncomfortable, right? And it's so important to broach these topics, especially with our young people, that we have to figure out a way to get past this discomfort, right? Or past the fact that like, you know, who am I? I'm a white person talking about, uh, you know, the history of the African diaspora. And, and you know, uh, what if I say something wrong, right? Um, so, so this book's an amazing resource to help with all that. And then the podcast, the Teaching Hard History podcast, are uh, each individual chapters from this book um, by the by the the um, the authors of the chapters doing the individual podcasts and then hosted by uh, Dr. Jeffries. So I I've gotten so much out of this book and 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 I would just strongly recommend it. And and likewise with the podcast and and a lot of the information that I gleaned about. First Peoples being exchanged for African slaves in the Caribbean um, was from one of the podcasts that I recently uh, listened to, as, as well as, you know, another great resource, which is a book called Black Lives Native Lands, um, which, which really discusses this whole issue of how um, First Peoples were exchanged for enslaved Africans. So, uh, but 
once again, you know, uh, I would I would say if you're really looking for resources, go check out the Atlantic Black Box website. Uh, there's an entire uh, list of resources. There's there's uh, books, uh, there's videos, there's images, um, all sorts of, of places at least to get started um, from there and to use as a jumping off point. Thank you. Those sound like great resources. I, I jotted down the name of the, the podcast while you were talking, and um, we will include in the, the email this afternoon that link to the Atlantic Black Box, and so all of those resources are, are listed there as well. Uh, we have lots to do, whether we're help, helping kids explore this history or, or grappling with it ourselves. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm just looking there. A couple questions that just came in. Um, what do you know about Dr. Antonius Lamy, the black doctor who served Portland in the 1670s? Oh, I, I'm sad to say I don't know anything. Well, there you go. You have your homework assignment too. <laughs> Wonderful, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Lamy. All right. Um, and then, is there a connection with the, the mills in Saco and enslaved Africans? Oh, of course, absolutely. Okay. I mean, the cotton for those mills obviously came from the backs of enslaved laborers. Um, so, you know, th those mills wouldn't be possible were it not for this institution of slavery. And this really, you know, points to the connection between kind of uh, slavery and early industrialization. Um, you know, the, the plantations in the Caribbean are really seen as the first kind of proto factories. So you have people, you know, working in kind of these factory like conditions, even though it's an agricultural undertaking. And so a lot of the products of early industrialization, like textile production, um, are, are intimately tied up with African slavery. You know, th this is really true in Rhode Island, where Rhode Island had many, many textile factories. Some of the textile factories in Rhode Island uh, uh, produced, a, I forget what the name of it was, a special type of cloth that was just worn by enslaved Africans. So you have these entire factories in Rhode Island that are just producing this cloth uh, to, to, you know, it's a very durable cloth, uh, cheaply made, um, that you know, that the enslaved Africans in the American South would be clothed in. So there's an intimate connection between the, the, the garment factories, the textile production here in Maine, and the production of the raw material that, that they needed for that, which of course was cotton, of course grown in the American South by enslaved Africans. Um. Last, I think we have time for one more question, and that's about the Valley Street neighborhood in Portland. Do you have any any information on that, or any sort of how does that connect in? I'm I'm not sure where where the Valley Street neighborhood is in Portland. All right, well there you go. We all have more to to explore. Um, thank you. This so has much. a note, Seth. It's over by Main Hardware and uh, Oh, okay, and St. Okay. John Street. Yeah. St. John's, yep. Which was, uh, and one of the few, few neighborhoods featured in, in the Green Book. Um, oh. In, in Jim Crow, yeah, so. Oh, well that's wonderful. I'll look into that, Will, thank you. A good question asked by a member. So always good questions, thank you all. So many good questions. Um, I really appreciate uh, you all joining us today for this, for this Lunch and Learn. And Seth, thank you so much for for everything you've you've shared with us today and all of the the ideas about how we can keep learning and, and exploring this together. Um, for every for all of our participants today, we will email you a brief survey later this afternoon, and we really welcome your feedback. So please take a few moments to fill that out. Uh, if you have enjoyed today's presentation, I encourage you to check out our future Lunch and Learns every Friday from noon to one. Next week, we will be joined by the New England Aquarium's Director of Ocean Policy, Kelly Chris, who will join us to explore the Northeastern Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument and to discuss President Trump's recent proclamation about the monument. Uh, it should be a fascinating conversation. Hope to see you all there. Thank you again, Seth, and to everyone, have a fantastic weekend.